Uh, good evening and welcome to everyone here, everyone online, and uh, uh, welcome to Net Vision 2011, a political debate about uh, some of the major political parties' visions and policies uh, for the internet and uh, for technology uh, post the election in November of this year. Uh, to people watching online, if you want to contribute uh, with questions after 8 o'clock, um, you can send them to us now. What is it? Hash net 11. Hash net 11 is where you can uh, uh, tweet your questions uh, to our politicians. I would like to just very quickly um, introduce them and then we're going to hear from, from uh, Vikram Kumar from Internet New Zealand. Um, lots have been drawn, so this is uh, completely fair, the order in which uh, you're going to hear from these people. Peter McCaffrey from ACT to my immediate re right next to him. Gareth Hughes from the Greens, good to see you Gareth. Claire Curran from Labour, Claire, welcome. Um, Kapua Smith uh, from the Māori Party speaking on uh, these issues for the Māori Party this evening. And as I said, we are waiting for National Stephen Joyce, who of course this evening is not a minister. He is representing a party running for office in an election. So he's just one of a gang, as far as we're concerned here. All right, um, without further ado, let me introduce Vikram Kumar from Internet New Zealand, who have set this all up for us. And Vikram's going to spend just a little bit of time framing the debate we're going to have this evening for you. Vikram. Thanks. Right. So I'm just going to settle in here. All right. right. And that's yours if you need it. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave it here. Okay. Probably better keep my hands closed. Okay. Hello, uh, good evening. Tena Kato Katoa. Welcome on, on behalf of Internet NZ. I'd like to... You need to, you need to use that, yeah. Right. So... Um, I'm going to spend about maybe 10 minutes, uh, the idea being that before we head off straight into the detail, we should just be able to step back for a little bit and um, try and frame some of what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, thank you so much for our panelists for being here, and thank you all in the audience. There's a lot of people online, and welcome to them all, and they can participate most certainly. Uh, the best way to do so is via Twitter using the hashtag net11. Um, and the people online particularly uh, thank you for using your valuable data cap. Uh, we know <laughs> that you know, that's a pretty precious commodity and if they're spending some of their data cap on looking at this uh, debate then most certainly it's uh, going to be of value for them. And I suspect there's a lot of people today evening who would probably be better off with a drink in their hand uh, wanting to talk either about the really tragic events that are happening in Tauranga or thinking about how we're going to get the French monkey off our back once and for all on Sunday. But uh, life does go on. Uh, even after Sunday, there will be a life no matter what happens. Um, so um, we have to, in some ways, think forward and put aside uh, things that we really want to talk about and focus about uh, things that are going to be quite important post Sunday. And um, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, really New Zealand's digital future. And um, it's, it's, it's definite, it's certain that New Zealand will have a digital future. You know, there's no doubt about that. So yesterday I looked at some of the data from Statistics New Zealand and did some back of the envelope calculations and figured out that there are approximately 3.7 million people in New Zealand aged 12 and over. That's roughly the same number of internet connections that we have in New Zealand, 3.7 million. So in other words, we've got approximately one internet connection for every person aged 12 years and over. And that's connections, um, and obviously there's an issue there because some people have multiple connections and some people don't have a connection at all. And undoubtedly, that'll be something that um, I suspect we're going to cover off today. But the reality is that uh, New Zealand is a highly connected country. Not only is it highly connected, um, out of the 3.7 million internet connections, approximately 55% or 2 million were mobile internet connections. So uh, we've already got a situation where mobile internet devices exceed fixed line. So I think it's worth keeping in mind that um, 
we're not talking about a hypothetical future, but we're talking about a future of digital technologies that will definitely exist. And the question before us is uh, what kind of future is that going to be? And um, we're going to hear, I hope, a bit today about policies. And it's worth keeping in mind that uh, just as goals don't make a strategy, policies are simply tools and an end to something else. And if we ask ourselves, what is that end for which we're going to be hearing about policies? I'd like you, welcome Minister, or oh, welcome Stephen, actually, today. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so just getting back to, we've got a digital future ahead of us. We've got some policies that we're going to hear about today. And I'd like you to indulge me for a minute to tell you about a story um, about what I learned many years back. And I want to take you back many, many years to university. And I was doing a class in corporate strategy. And we had a professor who's, who, who every year had a certain routine in the corporate strategy class. And he would, he would go on about various things. And he would then pick on individuals. And he, he knows that, that he's not going to get the right answer. And with the practice arrogance that comes over many years of picking on students, um, he had a certain routine. And so his question was that um, if you are J.R.D. Tata, and J.R.D. Tata was the uh, chairman of a very large industrial empire, uh, 100 companies, 50 countries, 25 industrial sectors. So if you are that head of that large empire, what is the single most important thing for you to be good at? And his typical um, routine was he would go in, you know, ask each person, and he would get wrong answers, good answers, but wrong answers. And so that particular year, um, he decided that there was this guy who was sleeping at the back of his class, um, me. And so he comes up and you know, rolls his eyes, looks down his nose and says, you, you know, what is that single most important characteristic for the head of this large industrial empire? And fortunately, I didn't think much about the answer. Um, and I was really happy that I gave the right answer that he was looking for, because the look of surprise on his face to have got the answer the first time around was a personal triumph of my university days. And of course, the answer is vision. Right? It's, it's absolutely the number one thing that whether you're the head of an industrial empire or you're the head of a country or indeed in many of our communities, the number one thing that we're looking for is vision. And effectively, that's what we are looking to today to hear about is we know that there is this future digital. We know that there are policies. What I'd really like to hear, and I think many people would like to hear, is what is this vision that we have which the policies will deliver? Um, and what we did was, if I can just borrow that to show people, if hopefully you've got a copy of that. It's called Future Digital. Uh, Internet NZ, over the last few months, has had lots of conversations with lots of people across New Zealand. And what we've tried to do is to distill some of those conversations and um, have a discussion starter that uh, when we start looking at a vision, it's just a sort of guide to make sure we cover off the right points. And there's five perspectives that are worth looking at, and I'll just summarize them. Um, the first one is most certainly the economic opportunity of the internet as well as digital technologies. And there is an aspirational, growth, uh, aspirational goal that the internet drives economic growth. But most certainly, while it is about the economy, it's not about the economy alone. Uh, there needs to be other factors that are interwoven into a fabric of change. On the social side, um, we're certainly looking for a digitally inclusive society so that um, the various digital divides that exist, in some way, we need to be able to make sure that we do bridge them. On the cultural side, it's important to recognize that uh, New Zealand is a multicultural uh, nation, and that in some sense, uh, any vision of the future will have to address us being a vibrant, multicultural identity. Fourth area is the environment, and it's quite topical, but uh, it's most certainly there is a need to protect the environment for future generations. And fifth and finally is a government that gets the internet, and that's quite clearly a 
a large part of the vision that we have to look at. So that's what uh, I, I guess the discussion is about today. But I just wanted to spend one last minute in sharing with you uh, one of the things that I'm thinking about and we've been thinking about for a while. And that is the internet itself. What makes the internet different from railroads or telephones or all the things that have gone before? Why is it that the internet is so disruptive? And why is it that it is changing so much? And again, you know, if you go back to that professor in the university class, there's probably a lot, a lot of good answers. Uh, we know that it's, that it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous, that um, there's you know, two-way two dialogue that's happening, it's relatively cheap uh, for most people, but not everyone. There is this notion that uh, you can innovate without anyone's permission. But the one thing that um, I keep coming back to is the fundamental change that the internet drives, in my opinion, is that it is driving a network society. And the organizing principle that we've had for hundreds of years now is a top-down hierarchy. And what the internet does is breaks that. It changes the top-down hierarchy to a network society. And there's many, many implications of that. But the implication that I just wanted to touch on was that for people who are in political parties, the problem has now become that you can't have an ICT spokesperson who can adequately deliver internet-related opportunities and policies. Because the segmentation of the policies into different boxes means that we are missing the point. The internet simply cuts across hierarchies. It cuts across segments. It's essentially about a network society. And so as we think about the vision today and as we think about policies today, um, I hope that one of the things we're thinking about is how is this network society going to evolve and what are the opportunities that we have? So thank you, and I'll hand it over to Sean now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vikram, and I think that sets it up pretty well. We want to hear not just about policies, and I don't think we just want to hear politicians arguing. We want to hear about vision and the part that the net and the digital age plays in the vision for the future. Now, we've drawn lots, as I said. Each of our spokespeople will have five minutes, starting uh, with Peter and working down uh, to Stephen Joyce. Then uh, Peter will get, because it might be quite a long time uh, before we get with five minutes, it'll be a wee while, he will get a one minute rebuttal. And then starting from Stephen Joyce back, we will allow the spokespeople, if they wish, to ask questions of the other candidates sitting next to them. So there will be a bit of by-play there. We'll have a wee break, hopefully about eight o'clock if, if we get through on time. And then uh, Sarah Putt, Computer World Editor, and Rob O'Neill, uh, Sunday Star Times Business Editor, they are monitoring online the questions that are coming in. They also have some questions of their own uh, for our spokespeople, and you will have the opportunity in the audience as well to ask questions. And we will spend the last hour in a hopefully enlightening and uh, interesting um, discussion where the questions are put to the politicians by you. So we've got a wee bit to get through. Um, bear with us. Um, and bear with us online as well. Don't forget, um, hashtag, uh, what is it, net? Net11, net if you want to ask questions online, which will be put later. So without further ado, we are trending. We are and we are trending, are we? We are trending already, fantastic. <laughs> You'll tell me what that means later, I'm sure. Uh, uh, first up, from ACT, um, welcome please to uh, Peter McCaffrey. Peter, you have five minutes, your time starts now. Uh, thank you, Sean, and uh, thank you, Vikram, for the introduction. Um, uh, Vikram's uh, introduction was very poignant because actually I'm here not as the IT spokesman because ACT doesn't have an IT spokesman. We also don't have an IT policy uh, because as, as Vikram said, um, IT isn't a thing, it isn't a particular policy, it's actually just a way of life. It's a, it's a, it's a part of New Zealand, it's a part of our world now. Um, and so we have to actually apply IT to everywhere that we're applying it. We also don't have an IT policy because we don't think that actually IT is really the government's role. We think that that's the private sector, it's individuals, and I'll be talking about more of that in a second, and I'm sure it will come up in the questions in the debate longer. Um, so as Sean said, I'm uh, Peter McCaffrey. I'm the ACT candidate for Otaki. Um, I'm 24. I'm a final year student at uh, Victoria University, where I'm doing a BA in political science, international relations, and a BSc in operations research and uh, statistics. And I'm also trying to live tweet while we're doing this as well, so we'll see how that goes. I don't quite know how that's going to go. Um, 
<laughs> so um, I, I think politics should be fun. Uh, I think that uh, often it's too boring and, and I think I can get away with it because I'm not an MP yet. Uh, Gareth seemed to do quite well now he's an MP, so we'll, we'll see. But um, I, I wanted to start out by asking the audience a question. Um, who here broke co copyright law today? <laughs> who here didn't? <laughs> who's, who's not sure? <laughs> who is right now? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Well, look, I think this for me highlights one of the problems we have. Um, the, I, I like to talk about copyright because it's a really good example of one of the areas where the government just can't keep, keep up with what's going on. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, Parliament was trying to pass a law to make it legal to put music on your iPod, um, which it hadn't been legal to do for quite a while. Um, and they passed the law, and I don't remember the exact dates, um, but it took, you know, four or five years, I think, to finally get done. And about a week later, Steve Jobs launched the video iPod and they'd forgotten to include video in the law. So you can now put music on your iPod, but you can't put video on your iPod. So it's ju just another example of really where the government can't cut, keep up in these sorts of areas with what's going on in technological changes. Um, and I think that's a big problem. And I think it's a really good example of actually where the government trying to get involved into try and stimulate growth and development in some of these areas is actually leading to the government holding back the private sector, holding back individuals, holding back innovation in a lot of these areas, which we'll come back to later. So, um, so X policies, as I said, we don't believe that the IT sector is an area where the government should be involved. So I can tell you that ACT won't tax your internet. I can tell you that ACT won't filter your internet. I can tell you that we won't int introduce a copyright levy. I can tell you that uh, we don't think the government should be building the internet. Um, I don't think that the government should be running the internet or regulating the internet. Um, and I also don't think that the government should be running some sort of competitor to Sky TV or iTunes or something like that, which again I'm sure will come up a little bit later in the questions. Um, we believe, our vision, if you like, that was talked about in the, in the introduction, our vision is actually that the government gets out of the way and allows the people who are innovating, the public, the private sector, to present their vision. We can have a marketplace of ideas where everyone can go at it themselves, see what they can come up with, and let's go with what works. Instead of letting 120 people in the beehive decide what the future is, the, per the perfect example of that, of course, is the ultra-fast broadband plan, where we have this idea that somehow fibre's the, fibre's the solution, that's where we're going to throw our money, and screw it if some other uh, better thing comes up in the future and we've already thrown all our money at one particular thing. Um, now, it may be that fibre is the solution, um, but it also may not. And so we don't think that the politicians are necessarily in the right place to be making those decisions, and we also don't think that it's fair that the public should be funding that when the politicians don't necessarily know what's going on in that area either. Um, Vikram talked about wanting a government that gets the internet. I don't want a government that gets the internet. I want a government that gets out of the internet. I want a government that leaves you alone on the internet and that lets us have the internet and lets it be open and free and not regulated. And I don't want a government that gets it. I do want a government that is open. So if we're talking about open source, if we're talking about um, access to digital, uh, digital content that the government creates, statistics, all that sort of stuff, that should be as open as possible. If it's being funded by taxes through the government, then of course everyone should be able to access it. Um, so in summary, going back to what Vikram said again, we don't want a top-down hierarchy in the, in the internet from the government. We actually want an open society where the internet is allowed to flourish, allowed to become a part of everything that we're doing in New Zealand, and I think that that is the best way to uh, develop uh, the New Zealand economy and the internet in New Zealand. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much indeed. Peter McCaffrey from ACT there. All right, on to Gareth. Uh, Gareth mm. Hughes uh, from the Greens, um, whose nose is less out of joint than it has been, I think, recently. Um, the floor's yours, Gareth. Oh, Sean's referring to my broken nose playing for the parliamentary rugby team. I would have been a bit safer on World of Warcraft or something else online. Uh, so, yeah, kia ora, namihinui kia koutou. Kia ora, it's wonderful to see you all. I'd like to acknowledge my panellists, the Minister, Sean, uh, most of all, all of you here tonight and online. Uh, so I'm the Greens ICT spokesperson. I can say in all honesty, this is one of my favourite portfolios. I've got nine of them. Uh, and it's just been an amazing journey learning about uh, the policy changes and the, the need for this. And I'd like to congratulate Internet New Zealand for this wonderful document. Uh, uh, thank Vikram for all this wonderful work and agree with the rub of it, which is, look, we need a strategy going forward if we're going to make the most of these tremendous opportunities uh, for New Zealand. 
our main line and our ICT policy is, look, we want an internet that benefits everyone. When it comes to my sort of personal vision for the internet, you just need to look at my email signature for my personal motto, which is connect, construct, contribute. We need to connect, we need to get everyone on these tools, making the most of it. We need to construct, whether it be the economy or new ways of communicating, and we need to contribute. The power for good of this technology is phenomenal. We need to harness it. So when you look at the Green Party, uh, I like to think the last recommendation of this document, which is in government that gets the internet, I like to think the Greens get it. Now we've been active online making audio blogs, video blogs, ho holding online public meetings. We're the only party with 100% of our MPs on Twitter, on Facebook. Before Parliament I worked for Greenpeace coordinating the sign-on campaign, where we used some new tools to get our message out for the need for climate action. It's such an important time, because all around the world you look at internet policy issues, and there's, they're happening with such speed, but with such importance as well. You've only got to look at the Middle Eastern countries with the Arab Spring and the, the crackdown of the government on policies there. You've got to look at uh, the role of censorship in China, and it's been a real pleasure to work with Nikki Kay and Claire Curran. We delivered on that promise we talked about at NetHui, which was to work closer together collaboratively uh, across those party lines, and we're working hard trying to open up our parliament and increase the engagement of MPs online and I'm hoping the next parliament will be the most online engaged parliament we'll ever see. So there's a whole host of issues facing us. I want to quickly run over some of the top level issues and look at a couple in particular, copyright and ultra-fast broadband and the Green Party policy. So a key issue and one that's often left out of the discussion is this digital divide. Sure we've got some wonderful stats for how many people are online but there's a whole chunk of the country who aren't online. There's a whole chunk, like my mum, who doesn't go on the internet because she's scared of her data cap. I think that's simply crazy in 2011. What we need to foster, and it's great to have Internet New Zealand's call on this area, is a compelling vision for what the internet is. Because it's not just laying fibre and digging holes. It is about how we change our world, how we use it for health, how we use it for delivering prosperity, how we uh, help environmental outcomes through better use of video conferencing, stuff like that. We see a lack of in, uh, internet access across the country. And it's not just the, the Skynet bill, the copyright infringing file sharing bill. Uh, I've uh, helped local communities, be it in Tauranga or Taranaki, keep their libraries free, and it's the same issue. What we need to preserve, and it's been great to work with the Librarians Association on it, is internet access for everyone, and our libraries are a great hub for that. What we're seeing is the internet potentially changing our democracy, and it's great to see the iGov system roll out, and there's some huge potentials there, even though I don't think anyone really knows about it at all. What we're seeing is our MPs getting more online, and there's a whole host of changes we could make, which is great working with the other MPs to roll that out. What we're seeing is the uh, ACTA treaty recently signed over in Tokyo, and more worryingly the Trans-Pacific Partnership, where some of those worst elements have been taken out of ACTA and exported directly into the TPP. What we're seeing on those two key issues, the broadband issue, which I'd like to begin with first, is that the Green Party supported it. We support the role of the state investing some money, obviously not as much as they were in Australia, to deliver better broadband. Where we fell down and why the Greens opposed the legislation was the policy. Now, with all respect to the Minister, the process was simply shocking. We had massive amendments tabled during the select committee process with a constrained public consultation period. We saw supplementary order papers or further amendments tabled literally on the floor of Parliament, uh, some actually bigger than the bill itself. What we saw was the uh, the most controversial element, the 10-year regulatory forbearance period for the, uh, the company, which was of course Telecom, rolling out the broadband, essentially like the Wild West, you know, to stir investment the idea was we have a Wild West environment. Now, as thanks to some real politics from the Māori Party, we saw the government had to modify it at the last minute. But what's worse, we've still got the Wild West environment, but what we've got is the government underwriting any potential losses in that period. When it comes to copyright issues, this is a passion of mine that's recent. Um, what we saw in the debate in Parliament wasn't a Parliament that gets the internet. We didn't see MPs get the internet. We saw a woeful uh, debate on it and ultimately a bad outcome. Now what the Green Party policy when it comes to copyright is first of all, and the priority has to be removing termination from the law. It's good that compromise, the so-called compromise was hammered out. Now the government has to take the advice of the UN Special Rapporteur Frank LaRue and promise it will never enact it or better yet remove it from the legislation. Second, we need to encourage greater online 
uh, legal options all around the world. This has been proven to show this is more effective at reducing copyright and supporting those artists. Now, many of you saw that uh, question I had with the Commerce Minister, Simon Power, when I asked, well, what are you doing about something like Netflix? And he simply went, huh, what's that? I find that simply incredible that the government has spent probably millions of dollars setting up the new uh, agency, all the submission, tens of thousands of person hours debating the copyright issue, yet they couldn't even look at the single most effective thing we could do, providing online access. Obviously the government won't have all the answers, but I can't believe they haven't even looked into it a little bit. Thirdly, what we need to do is have a debate, kind of what Peter was saying, what does copyright mean in 2011? Now Copyright Act, dating back to 1994, essentially was written in a pre-internet environment. We need to have a debate. What does copyright mean? What is its purpose? What do we want to achieve from it? So I've drafted a private member's bill on parody and satire as a protection for fair use. And I'm sure that's interesting that you're out of time. Am I out of time? Yeah, sorry. Thank you very sure. much indeed, Gareth. Gareth, you <laughs> He was in full flight too, wasn't he? <laughs> Just warming up. Um, Claire Curran from Labor. The floor is yours now. Thank minutes. you. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. First of all, I want to thank uh, Internet New Zealand. Uh, I think this having a forum like this is great. I want to thank you for your document, which is uh, a, a really good blueprint, and it's a really good strategy. And I have to say that there's uh, stuff in it that I think should be in our policy and isn't, and happy to answer any questions on that later on. Um, I want to thank my fellow panellists, especially Mr Joyce. This is the first time in three years that we've been on the same panel together, so it's great to be here and get the opportunity to have a discussion and hopefully not argue with each other too much. Um, um, I want to, you know, I'm a person that uh, likes to practice what I preach. Can't say I always do it, but that's what my intentions are. And you know, when you think about three years ago, gosh, you know, things have changed. When I look down this panel, and I don't know about you, but three of us out of five are constantly engaging in the online environment, often with each other, um, and certainly with lots of you. And I think that's a great thing. There is much more of a connection directly between politicians and people now that doesn't have to involve individual face-to-face -face contact. That is a really good thing. Um, I'm the spokesperson for ICT and broadcasting, and I have written, uh, and my party has delivered, a converged policy. It's the first one that we've had in New Zealand, and it's really important. And I do want to make the point tonight that it doesn't include the full broadcasting se segment of that policy, which is yet to be announced. Um, there is another policy which will also be announced in a couple of weeks' time, or three weeks, or whenever I get a date, on open government. So I just want to say it's not all out there yet, guys. I hope you've all read it. It's called Digital Nation. And it essentially, and I know I'm not, I'm going to get cut off here, but and I'm not going to touch, try on, I'm not going to try to touch on everything because there is a lot in it. Um, that the ideas behind it are about a vision, a vision, and a plan, and I think that's really important. And I think that that's what Internet New Zealand is trying to communicate to us tonight: is that that's what we need. We need to have a vision, but we also need to have the plan to execute it. And that plan is about New Zealand becoming a digital nation. Now, I absolutely believe in that. I think, and so does my party, that we need to put a, a, a stake in the ground and say. New Zealand, in terms of its economic development, can become a digital mm. nation. And that means that we put more emphasis on mm. digital exports and on what we can do as a nation to stand out in the world um, and to and go forward and so that we do have a future. In order to do that, we have to grow digital Kiwis. And we have to invest in innovation and skills in the digital, digital environment and education, and we have to close the digital divide. Mm. There should be no digital divide in this country. And when I think about the digital divide, somebody somewhere today I actually read that there are three ways of looking at it, and they're all important. There's an age difference, there's a socio, there's how much you earn difference, and there's a where you live difference. 
All of those things are really important. If we are to become a digital nation, we have to address all of those things. Currently, there is, I think it's the statistics tell us that 20% of New Zealand are not on the internet. 100,000 families with school-aged children um, and with children generally uh, exist in our country who do not have a computer at home. That's not good enough. We have to do something about that and we have to do it as fast as we possibly can. So our plan is uh, and also includes a government, and this is where we um, have a big difference with ACT, is that we do need a government that shows leadership, that puts in place structural changes in terms of policy and the regulatory environment across the whole spectrum of telecommunications, ICT, broadcasting and the internet. And I've said to you for three years, can we come up with another name for it? Because it's merged, it's happening now, and it's not they're not all distinct things anymore. Um, and, we've, and as I said, it, we elevate the importance of the ICT sector as an export economy with skilled job creation and education for all Kiwis. I just want to say a couple of things about our style in terms of going forward, um, that we, I think, and I think that has been demonstrated in this portfolio, are a party that's prepared to listen, prepared to listen to the sectors and prepared to talk with you and engage with you. We're prepared to work collaboratively. It's really important that we work collaboratively because a really important point to make is that this policy isn't about what a Labour government would do just on its own. It's about what you would do as well. We want to put in place the plan and the strategy and some settings around that, but ultimately it's up to New Zealanders as to, um, and to the sectors as to what you make of it and how you make it work. Thank that's you, really that's important. over five minutes. Thank you very much indeed, Claire. Um, there'll be more time to join the debate uh, after this. Uh, welcome uh, now to our uh, speaker from the Māori Party, Kapua Smith. Uh, kia ora, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa um, to the audience, Internet New Zealand, our journalists. Um, parliamentarians and Minister, to you as well. I'm here on behalf of our Māori Party co-leaders, Dr Peter Sharples and Tariana Turia, who couldn't be here tonight. I am not a politician, actually. I am a member of the Māori Party Rangatahi Group, which is their youth wing, um, to talk about something which is very close to my generation, <laughs> which is living in a digital world. I just wanted to comment quickly on the document that you handed out, and it is a wonderful document, um, on the principles that you've outlaid in terms of the internet driving economic growth. One of the principles that the Māori Party truly believe in is that the internet is not just a tool for economic growth, but also a tool for social and cultural change and development. And that is the view with which we have developed our internet and digital policy, which we are about to announce tonight. Um, but before I go there, I also want to talk quickly about the digital divide. Now, as we all know, 20 to 30 per cent of New Zealanders are not connected to the internet. A large proportion of those are actually Māori people. And as you mentioned, it is not just about ethnicity, it is about age, it is about income gap, um, and it is about all those issues, which is why we were pleased to support the national government and their plan to roll out the UFB and the RBI program to ensure that every Māori community has access to the internet. Now that is one of the steps that our Minister, Dr Peter Sharples, our co-leader, has taken. Um, I also just wanted to quickly comment on one of the initiatives that our other Minister and co-leader, Tariana Turia, has invested into, and that is computer clubhouses and computers in homes. Um, the Māori Party secured 8.3 million in 2010 and an extra 3 million in the most recent budget to support the rollout of those programs for the pure reason that we support equal access to the internet. It is a very important principle to us because we view the internet as important infrastructure. Infrastructure that's not only economic but as mentioned previously, social and cultural infrastructure. If we want to develop our people then we know our people live in rural communities. They're very special to us. Um, they are our Tūranga Waiwai. Um, they are our spiritual home. And you may realise that in rural areas, 
that is one of the areas most affected by access issues to the internet. So it's very important to us to, that we develop, um, we develop an understanding of the cultural issues that coincide with the internet issues. Now one other issue I wanted to quickly comment on before we move on to announcing our policy tonight um, is the issue about content and um, sharing our cultural content online can often be quite a touchy issue for Māori. As you know, we are quite staunch on our intellectual property rights and protection of our cultural intellectual property. Now that's a conversation we yet to have, but one thing that the Māori Party is very interested in is how do we open up this great tool, this great piece of infrastructure, which is the internet, while also protecting our intellectual property and ensuring that our communities from whom the intellectual property derives actually benefits from it in the first instance. So without further ado, I will announce our Māori Party policy on behalf of our co-leaders who are not here today. We will invest in digital hubs to be established in communities and rural marae. Now this is a part of growing our communities from our homelands, from our ahikā sites. We will work with computer manufacturers to assist with national rollout of computers in homes. We will review the 2008 digital strategy to ensure it is meeting the requirements of our digital environment, including responding to those with special needs. Expanding employment opportunities in the information, computer and telecommunications technology sector through Ngāpū Wire, through the rural and ultra-fast broadband rollout, including Māori cadetships in the digital creative sector. We will invest in opportunities to migrate Māori educational content into the digital environment, e.g. te reo versions of digital publications and books. And finally, all citizens with access to email will have the option of receiving their mail from government departments via email. Those who opt for this will receive a government subsidy on their internet connection. So as you can see, our policy is very much focused on ensuring access, um, particularly to those who a well, who do not earn as much as others do. So these are the policies that have been developed, and I suppose just to summarise before I pass on to our Minister, um, the vision for the Māori Party. The vision for the Māori Party is a society that has equal access to our digital resources. The vision for the Māori Party is that we have equal access to infrastructure that will develop our economic, cultural and social aspirations. The vision of the Māori Party is that we live in a digitally literate society, and the vision of the Māori Party is that we all value our cultural intellectual property and treat it appropriately. Kia ora. Thank you very much indeed, um, Kapua Smith. All right, last, uh, probably not least, uh, I know you've been busy with one or two things happening around the country that don't involve rugby, uh, Stephen Joyce. Uh, you are here this evening as, well, I guess, a spokesman, a candidate rather than a minister. It's, a, it's an election debate. So, Stephen Joyce. You and the National Party have five minutes. Off you go. Thanks very much, Sean. Can I say it's great to be here and also uh, to Internet New Zealand uh, for hosting this. I think that's a fan fantastic opportunity. I um, just want to make a few points to start with. I've been listening to the speakers along the way. I think, um, firstly, I think it's good that we all believe in the digital nation because it's coming whether politicians are ready for it or not. So it's probably quite handy that we're, um, that we're, that we're uh, sort of attaching our, our uh, ropes to that particular initiative. Uh, because the, the country is moving digital around us, uh, the young people are moving digital ahead of us, uh, and it's important that we really facilitate that in terms of, uh, in terms of the infrastructure and the uh, opportunities that we provide to allow people to become connected. Uh, uh, I personally am, am very focused on this whole issue of a digital divide. I've been very active, in fact, soon after I became Minister uh, in supporting computers and homes, I was invited to the early uh, to one of the one of the um, award sessions uh, in Parliament, and had the opportunity to meet a whole bunch of people who had benefited from that program. So it's been great to work with Tariana uh, on computers and homes, and also with the computer clubhouses. Uh, and, um, and the other very important part about the digital divide is the you know the the risk of the urban rural divide, uh, and. Uh, and one of the challenges with whenever you have a new infrastructure that rolls out, whether it's electricity transmission 100 years ago, or or it's uh, or it's uh, fibre optics and uh, and uh, and high speed internet today, is making sure that rural networks actually get developed, uh, because of course they are much less economic than the urban ones, 
And so the RBI program is something that uh, I'm very proud that this government has put together. Uh, we've managed to do that and tackle the TSO uh, reform issues at the same time. Uh, it seems a light years ago that every uh, telecommunications company was arguing about how much they were paying in TSO, and now it's all going into a telecommunications development levy, which is being used to fund the rollout of extra network infrastructure in rural areas. Uh, so that's very, very, it's very pleasing, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to be involved in that. Uh, um, there's been talk a lot about strategies and visions and all those things, and I think they are important, but actually I have to say probably I'm a bit more focused on um, getting things done and looking for the opportunities uh, to improve access and to remove the blockages as we get more connected. And uh, government, I believe, has a role in doing that in terms of identifying carefully where the gaps are and then saying, okay, well, what's the opportunity to fill those gaps, rather than saying that the government should lead. I think in this space, the government, I agree with our friend from, I think it was ACT, uh, who said that uh, the government is going to be way too slow on this stuff. It's moving way ahead of the government. And I think that's right, and that's actually quite neat. Uh, but, uh, but I think we have a role, particularly, in, as it turns out, in the infrastructure space, uh, to ensure that the development actually occurs. So, yep, it would be, um, I suppose, uh, good in some ways if that was able to happen without uh, taxpayers being involved. But back here in the real world, uh, we actually do have to make um, a, a contribution to facilitate uh, this actually happening. And the ultra-fast broadband scheme uh, does it. Uh, I think it does it very well. If you ask the three tests, uh, how much does it cost to build? It's got a low build cost. How much will it cost consumers? Well, it's lower than expected and how much is the cost to taxpayers will significantly lower than expected. And I suppose you'd have to say a lot lower than what the Australians are spending, which is roughly around 31 billion Australian uh, to do something very similar. And so on that basis, um, there has been critics, I've one or two not too far from me at the moment, but, um, but uh, you know, the criticisms have been it's happening too slow at different times, it's happening too quickly at different times, it's had too much telecom in it or not enough telecom in it, that depends on which um, months that, it's, uh, that, it, that these uh, criticisms are made. But I think at the end of the day, we've got a system which is going to uh, be successful in, in, in delivering that uh, ultra-fast broadband, also much faster broadband in rural areas. But there's much more to do. Uh, the digital dividend spectrum is very important. We've brought that ahead two years, um, the digital switchover. I think that's uh, very important to make sure we also get the wireless infrastructure in place. And there's also things in the regulatory space, and of course we will all remember the long-running mobile termination rate saga, uh, which has been finally concluded uh, by this government while we've been in office. So I like to think um, we're getting a reputation for making uh, good steps forward. We've got to do lots more to take advantage of these things, not so much try and uh, direct the internet. I think that's a, a bit uh, limiting uh, for the careers of politicians, but making sure that health, education, government services are all uh, focused on actually taking advantage of the ultra-fast broadband and rural broadband networks. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. And what, 10 seconds under time? Brilliant. <laughs> Uh, all right, time now, um, because he was first quite some time ago. Now, for Peter McCaffrey, we'll give you a minute, minute and a half in rebuttal, if there's anything there you want to address. Um, well, for, first off, thanks for Stephen to uh, sort of uh, agreeing with me that, you know, often the, um, the government can struggle to keep up with a lot of these issues. You know, I, I gave a couple of examples. Um, uh, and he, he said that somehow infrastructure is an exception. Um, I would argue that it's not. Um, it can be longer timelines, but actually, you know, if you look at the investment that's going into the ultra-fast broadband at the moment, we don't know if that's going to be a good investment yet because nobody can foresee the future. Um, I'm looking at the phone that's here in my pocket, and the internet connection I have on my phone is quicker than my landline was just a couple of years ago, and it has a larger data cap than my mum currently has at her home. Um, so, I mean, why necessarily is ultra-fast broadband the solution, in, particularly in some of these uh, rural areas where wireless or uh, network 3G or even 4G might be the solution? Um, and also with data cap, I noticed someone pointed out on Twitter, actually um, the cap isn't the problem, it's the cost of buying the data. Um, prices actually are important, they send a signal to people to provide the right amount of data. There's no reason why someone who uses 100 gigabytes a month should pay the same as someone using 2 gigabytes a month. We just need to get that cost down to a reasonable place so that the people who are using 100 gigabytes a month can afford to, and the people that are using 2 gigabytes a month can, use, can afford to use more if they want to. Um, and the way to do that is to get the right investment, and again that's where we differ on how we get that investment into that sector. So. 
All right, thank you very much indeed. All right, time now for you to quiz each other. We'll go in reverse order. Uh, and if you don't have a question um, for Emmy, any of the other spokespeople, you, you don't have to exercise uh, this option. The time will be allocated elsewhere. Stephen Joyce, do you have anything to quiz any of your other panellists on? Well, I suppose my question for Claire is, is why you think it's a good idea to lever the internet to pay for content? Well, um, if you read the policy, what you'll see that we've said is that we're investigating um, a, a, a levy, a funding mechanism as to how, uh, as, as to how and whether um, you could make content, New Zealand content, more available uh, to New Zealanders in a digitised format. And I think the point, there's two points I want to make, and one is that, um, that this issue came up two and a half years ago, or nearly three years ago actually, when um, the copyright debate really blew up after the last election. And when people said to me, and a number of you were in the room when, uh, it w during the workshops that were held around that time, and could we stop talking about punishing people for downloading and sharing information with each other that they're just wanting to do for their own use? And could we talk about the fact that a lot of this stuff isn't available um, in, in any other way? Um, so that, and, and the, the, that was when the levy idea came up. Um, as a potential uh, mechanism which might be a way of dealing with that. Um, and the second issue is that we need more New Zealand content um, and that's a fundamental fact. In fact, you know, if anyone in the room disagrees with me, um, put your hand up. Uh, could, could I just ask a supplementary there? So would you also support, say, a broadcasting licence fee or a television licence fee because that is the same philosophy, is it not? I think that what I... What we need to do, Sean, is to have a public conversation about a funding mechanism that goes that is in the digital space and it may be in the public broadcasting space. All right. Any more questions for anyone? Stephen Joyce? I don't, how many are I allowed? I yeah, you get two. You get two. <laughs> I, I want a second one. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. It's called a supplementary. So, oh, a supplementary. <laughs> Does it have to be on the same topic? No, not necessarily. <laughs> oh, that's I'm great. making okay. this up as I well, go Well, I have along, a question for Claire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Claire, um, uh, I think, I mean, I may be wrong, but I think most people just think we should get on and finish the UFB now and make it happen. So um, why would you want to stop it uh, for six, nine, maybe 12 months? I know you've said six, but these things, and, and have another discussion about it, because I think we've been discussing it for two and a half years, and at different times you've criticised it for not going fast enough and having too much discussion. Interesting question, Stephen. And, Thank you, Claire. And given the fact that it took two and a half years for your government and for you to come up with a plan to actually put behind your slogan um, to cut to actually deliver the UFB, I think that it's uh, it's kind of ironic for you to come back at me with that question. Um, I have uh, we have not said that we would put the UFB on on pause, on the pause button for six months. What we've said is that within six months, we would have done a quick review and we would um, have a way forward. Our intention is, in fact, our intention is the opposite. We think you've taken way too long to get a program in place that we are worried is going to deliver um, a commercial monopoly at the wholesale level, a commercial monopoly at the retail level, and potentially a commercial monopoly at the content level. And whose interest is that going to be in? Is it going to be the people of New Zealand's, or is it going to be the vested interests behind those commercial monopolies? So our intention is to hurry things up, uh, that's, and if you read the policy careful, carefully, then that's what you'll uh, be able to read into it, that we actually want more people to get access more quickly. OK, that answers uh, that question. Kapua Smith, you have two questions to anyone else on the panel. I just had one question, um, and I noticed that most of us talked about the digital divide, and this is a question for Peter of ACT. Um, seeing as you have no ICT policy, how you plan to address the digital divide Oh, well, I think that ACT's economic policies are absolutely the best to encourage the uh, growth in the economic conditions of the poorest people in New Zealand, and that the best way to get people on the internet, to get people into better lives and into the digital life, would be to improve the economic situation. 
Actually, I do have a second. Yeah, I thought you might. <laughs> <laughs> Supplementary question in regards then to our economic policy. How do you develop um, the economic situation and economic opportunities for our rural communities where there is, um, well, there's a shortage of critical infrastructure? Yeah, well, I mean, this is actually one of the areas where ACT have a lot in common with the Maori Party. You know, we've we've worked together quite a bit on policies like whanau order and things like that to develop those rural communities, to to get the power away from the government and devolve those sorts of services and provision of welfare and health and all those sorts of things into local communities and to help them really in that way. Because, again, I think um, that's one of the areas where ACT and the, Ma and the Maori Party agree is that uh, a top-down sort of government-provided type service isn't always the best way to do it, and actually getting services into the community and letting people who know what they're doing and are actually in that area and in that community and know how it works are the best place to develop and provide those services. So. All right, thank you. Claire Karen. Cool. Your turn. I get to ask a couple of questions. Um, my first question is to uh, Mr Joyce. And <laughs> today um, John Key acknowledged, um, acknowledged that there's a there is, remains a growing underclass in New Zealand. Um, he said it in a way that seemed as if he was a bit of a spectator. Um, and I believe that government isn't a spectator and, and as you pointed out, Kaipua, that we've talked about the digital divide, all of us, I think, except for ACT, um, and the importance of that. Now, I want to talk about schools because um, a key part of your policy is taking fibre to schools. Now, what you're doing is you're taking fibre to the school gate. Now, I want to know what you're going to do and how people, and I've got three schools, one in Kaitaia, one in New Plymouth and one in Belclutha, um, who, who tell me that they're going to have to pay up to $100,000 to take that fibre, to upgrade their wiring, to upgrade the PCs and the devices inside the, the school, before they even have to deal within their existing operations grants with, um, with paying the increased um, prices for data usage. Now, how can you then say that you've got this transformation taking place in New Zealand mm -hmm. when there are the schools that can afford to do it, maybe, maybe be able to do it. But those schools who are approaching me, who are saying, well, we just can't afford it, how are they supposed to do it? Uh, well, that's a good long question. I'll try and make the answer longer. Um, the, um, the, uh, look, two things. Firstly, uh, the, uh, the link from the road to the school is being paid for. It's being paid for under a contract um, with uh, the Ministry of Education. That's being done now, so I'm not quite sure where that comes from. And the other thing is we are spending hundreds of million dollars on network upgrades in schools right mm -hmm. across the country. And, um, and that's Will it cover the whole cost? Uh, the schools pay a contribution, I think it's about 20% from memory, and the 80% is paid for um, through the ministry, so which is a pretty good deal. Um, uh, and, and of course they pay some out of, uh, from their operation budgets, but I think um, they will all and get it. And that's the issue. And, uh, well, you can say that's the issue, well, but actually it's going to reduce their um, costs of, you know, one of the biggest issues for schools around the country is how much they're having to spend on some of their services to support um, to support their IT now. And uh, the, one of the great advantages of, of getting the UFB and getting fibre into every school, or not to, to nearly every school, is, um, is allowing it to, allowing them to you take advantages of things like cloud computing and those sorts of things and get the sort of services that they, that they need without actually having to have all this extra contractor support. And I think that's actually gonna improve uh, the outcomes for schools. There are so many holes in that answer, but I, I hope other people will ask questions around that. Can I ask a really short se yes. second question? Snappy. Do you yeah. believe that convergence is happening between the broadcasting and telecommunications sectors? And, um, and do you believe that, uh, that some regulation is required to harmonise um, the rules across both those sectors? Uh, are you talking to me? Clear. I am, yes. Mr oh, Joyce. <laughs> um, the, um, look, I, I think they, the, two are, the, the two are definitely converging. I mean, we've already seen it with the mu uh, but, you know, music industry and, um, and, uh, and the way music is distributed online. We're seeing it with video. 
and the way video is distributed online. I mean, YouTube is, is YouTube is basically the the convergence of video uh, with uh, with the internet, and that's going to happen more and more. The question you then have to ask yourself before you say, okay, well, it's happening, therefore, do I have to regulate it on the sort of grounds of moving it? If it moves, regulate it. Then you have to think about what actually is going to occur with this um, with this change, and what is actually going to occur is you're going to get a democratisation of the whole area of video content in a way that you haven't had uh, uh, previously. Because if you think about the old broadcasting model and even the, 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 the broadcasting, the pay broadcasting model of an outfit like Sky, uh, the way they keep control of the content is being the distributors and being the only ones that can distribute that content. That's how they keep control of it. So the value in the value chain is held by the distributing channel rather than uh, by the content creator. And that's all changing as part of this. So what's happening now is there's going to be, as a result of the UFB, more and more opportunities for content creators to distribute directly. It's what happened in the music business with suddenly uh, the power of music companies being broken down and, it's being, uh, and being picked up by the bands themselves and the artists themselves. The same thing is going to happen in the content space. And I think, therefore, before you rush in and regulate and risk being in the situation, uh, where you're regulating after the fact and the thing's already moved on without you. You should be aware of the dynamics of it, which is over time, the outfits that control broadcasting now are actually going to have that broken down and the content creators are going to sell their content directly online, directly to consumers. OK, that's an answer. Now you might have been feeling a little left out, Gareth. <laughs> You've got a couple of questions. Well, I can ask a question now, so thanks, Sean. Yeah. My question's a one-word one for all the panellists, which is, has anyone looked at the new Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights, which came out last month, and is there any appetite from your parties to work on something similar for New Zealand that deals with net neutrality and rights and responsibility in regards to the internet? Have you been checking out the... Uh, yes and no, uh, the internet isn't a fundamental human right because that implies that there's an obligation on someone to provide it to you. It's a service that you should pay for. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be trying to get it as cheap and as accessible as possible, but it's a service and we shouldn't be assuming that people should be providing a service to someone for nothing because it's a right. Claire? Um, uh, not specifically in terms of having a really good look at it. No, it's there. No, it's important. And yes, want to work on that areas and hoping to work with Gareth um, in the next Labour-led government um, on some of these issues. Okay, um, Smith. <coughs> no, and yes. <laughs> That's good. And Stephen Joyce, have you been just, checking just out? Just checking, is the, was it the Brazilian Internet Bill of Bill Rights? Rights. Yeah. Weirdly, no. Um, <laughs> but um, it's interesting. But I, I share the view that um, I'm not convinced that um, it's a fundamental human right if that's actually created in the policy. Um, as I said, a discussion around tertiary education recently, and some, um, somebody from the Student Association said, uh, do you believe tertiary education is a fundamental human right? And I said, hmm... I sense the second supplementary question to this is if I say yes, then why isn't it completely free for everybody? Um, and I think there's a bit of that that goes on with those sorts of questions. I won't clarify what the bill was about, but um, I encourage everyone to check it out because it's cool. My last question is to the, to the Minister, which is, were you seriously saying in regards to the UFB bill that it was a success because you managed to annoy everyone? And is that your measure of success? And lastly, why as <laughs> Minister of Communications aren't you on Twitter or Facebook? <laughs> well, I am actually on Twitter. Oh, well, you have yes, but I don't. To I know. <laughs> <laughs> is, is your profile secret? I'm probably or a little. <laughs> I'm probably a little more conservative. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I don't. I don't tweet. I just. I just look at tweets. Is that all right? Is that allowed? You're a voyeur. Um, <laughs> tweet voyeur. But um, I'm. I'm. Um, I love the fact that you can watch the questions that people are going to ask <laughs> on Twitter. That's very cool. I also, the other thing I like is when you go out of conferences and they have a Twitter wall, a tweet wall, and you find instantly how much people don't like you. <laughs> um, or like you occasionally. That's, that's fun too. Um, the first question, uh, Gareth, look, I just don't agree with your... Um, I just don't agree with the way you, uh, way you said that about the, the, the UFB process. Yep, it's a robust process. 
Uh, yep, it's challenging, but if you look at what we've achieved here compared to, for example, the Australian process, which many of us will have seen, uh, which has taken uh, at current count at least one year longer, has been way, way more divisive, hugely more expensive, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and really I don't think is set up as well, he said uh, modestly, um, as the one that we've um, produced at this point, then genuinely uh, I don't think you can measure the success of a policy by how much the opposition doesn't like it. All right. That's an answer. Uh, Peter, finally, a couple of questions from you to anyone else on the panel. Yep. Um, I have a question for Claire. Um, what makes you think that Phil Goff could run an online content service better than Steve Jobs? And uh, wouldn't actually New Zealanders be better off if you just let them keep that money or maybe gave them an iTunes voucher? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd still do a better job. <laughs> Very short answer. Um, and the, sh the answer is market failure. Do you believe there's been market failure? I absolutely do believe there is market failure, and I really want to hear from the audience about this later. I think it's a really important discussion to have. Too. Okay, well, that's an answer. Peter, another question? Um, and my second is for uh, Stephen Joyce, um, actually in relation to your question to Claire earlier. Um, if you disagree that there should be a levy on the internet and with Claire's response that it you know, should be paid, used to pay for content, um, will you get rid of non-internet content funding or at least treat it equally with internet content funding? Um, I'm, it'd be outside my my uh, my area. You're basically talking about broad. Well, you're, you're taxing content. people to pay. You're, you're opposed to taxing people to pay to generate internet-based content, and yet the government does collect tax to pay for non-internet-based content. content. Well, actually, I think so. Why the why the difference? I think I think probably there there is a role for uh, government to encourage um, New Zealand stories to be told. If that's you know, un un economic, that doesn't mean to say that, that should be internet content or not internet content. I think one of the challenges for New Zealand uh, on air and those sorts of uh, organisations as you move into a very um, uh, a fragmented uh, broadcasting space, literally run over uh, uh, ultra-fast broadband or, and, and fast broadband generally, is how you are going to use that model effectively um, to, to create content which otherwise wouldn't be created, which tells New Zealand stories. And I think there is a role for that, uh, but, um, but it's, it's, the, the role is now being challenged in the traditional broadcast. That's a convergence community. issue in some ways, isn't it? It is, but you didn't necessarily run out and get a big convergence regulator to solve the problem. How come it's happening every, in many other countries in the world and you, you, you've got your head in the sand? Well, I don't think that's true, Claire. I, I mean, I appreciate your view, but... <laughs> Look, I'm um, going to have to stop you there because we're, we're over time for our break and um, we're out of format. And I'm sure we're going to get back there <laughs> during the course of the day. Uh, your questions next from, uh, next from our online audience, from our, well, I call you a studio audience, our live audience, and also from our tame uh, journalists to my left. We're going to take a break for, what, um, five minutes. We're just going to have a little bit of a relax, um, give our panellists a bit of a break, give you time uh, to go to, what was it again? Hash Net11 um, and uh, submit your questions. It's there on the bottom of the screen. Submit questions via Twitter, uh, Hash Net11. I'll be back with you in five minutes, live. <laughs>